Welcome to the Faith is Not Blind podcast. I'm Sarah Devonier, and I'm thrilled to be here with Melissa Inouye. I have been an admirer of her for a long time. Her work as a church historian and her writings and her personal history, but our connection actually goes back further than that. Uh, one really fun thing about our connection is it goes back to my parents, Bruce and Marie Hafen, and Melissa's uncle Dylan. And if you've read the Faith is Not Blind book or heard them talk about their personal history, they got to know each other in a class called Solving Your Religious Problems. And if you've ever heard them speak about it, they talk about how they solved their greatest religious problem by meeting each other and getting married. Well, <laughs> part of the story that Melissa's connected to is her uncle Dylan Inoy was in that class. And one thing as a member of the church and as a person who loves learning myself that I've always loved about this story is they talked about meeting in class and talking about their religious, their religious problems, but then taking the classroom in the hallways and outside and continuing the conversation. And I feel honored today to feel like we're continuing that conversation right now. Yeah. And so thank you for being here to continue the conversation of solving your religious problems years later. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. I, I love and respect my Uncle Dylan so much. And for in so many ways, he was kind of my model as, you know, what is a Latter-day Saint academic? And how does the gospel shape scholarship? And um, also, how does, how does the gospel shape the way that you teach? I think Uncle Dylan was an amazing teacher. Yes. I always heard stories about the crazy stuff he did with his students, <laughs> and um, and I've always tried to be like him. So it's just such a pleasure to be here. With yeah, you. thinking thinking of that, I I have my journal from when I was eight years old, and I have an entry about your uncle Dylan when he came to family home evening. Oh wow! He came to family home evening, you know, just like normal people do. We invited my parents invited a scholar to teach us for family home evening. And he divided us into teams, and I was on Dylan's team. So mm -hmm. as an eight-year-old, I was on his team, and he taught us a lesson and then had us be in these groups. And the thing that he taught us was how you learn is, not, um, is just as important as what you learn. Mm. And I wrote about it in my journal as an eight-year-old. That's very impressive. Uh, yes. It says a lot about <laughs> the kind of eight-year-old well, you were, too. <laughs> well, and, and I thought, you know, I, I've been thinking about that as, as I've been preparing with this interview with you, and, and hopefully we can discuss that a little bit. Um, as, as you said, talking about church scholarship, and you're a church scholar, that what we learn is important, but how we learn it is equally as important, sometimes more important. So we'll, we'll circle back to that. But if for people who... Um, need to know a little bit about your scholarship, your work as a church scholar. Will you just give a brief introduction of yourself, a brief sort of bio of the important things about you, and then we'll talk in more detail about your story. Okay. So um, again, thanks so much for having me here on this podcast. It's such a pleasure and an honor. Um, so I guess I could say that I grew up in Southern California. I uh, It's a super fun, diverse place. I thought that it was normal for, um, for I don't know, I, I just thought um, like that kind of super diverse environment was, was normal. Um, I went to school on the East Coast and, uh, oh, super diverse laid back environment. And then I got to um, school in Boston and there were like people who like wore like these sweater vests and <laughs> like multiple layers of things out of wool. And, and elbow um, patches. They read the New Yorker <laughs> and they were 18. I was like, who are these people? Um, super serious, very smart people. And, um, and so that was like the first time I kind of had culture shock and I realized that I was from a certain place with these certain ideas and assumptions about what was normal and cool. And, and I was suddenly in this new environment where I, I realized there were these other norms. And um, it, I went to school uh, hoping to be uh, like a, some sort of marine biologist or something because I loved animals. And then I um, took chemistry, and I did not love that. I was like, no, <laughs> this is not for me. And then I, um, I took Chinese. And um, that was when I just got sucked into the kind of beauty and um, power of the Chinese language and Chinese history. 
and ended up getting a PhD. I um, married my, oh, we, I went on a mission um, before getting a PhD and that's where I was um, madly attracted to my husband. Just kidding. Um, I always <laughs> like um, say my husband and I met on my mission, but we like never were in the Ever. same area. Never. We never nope. were in the same district. <laughs> um, but after, um, after we came home, we corresponded and I did really like his Chinese. He was like the best Chinese speaking missionary in the whole mission. And for me, that was like extremely attractive. <laughs> yes, of so, course. Um, so his career has taken him to Hong Kong. Um, wh where we also went, of course, and, uh, and he's done a lot of interesting things. But in the course of that, I was kind of, um, I had my degree, but I hadn't really started working yet because I had four kids and, um, you know, Hong Kong was like, yeah, so busy and, you know, he was never home. And we would like, I would literally make dinner, pack it up into plastic containers, and then we'd get on the bus and we'd like go take the bus into Central and we'd have dinner with him in what we called Papa's house. <laughs> Um, was in, that at his office? In a food court <laughs> below his office. We'd have our family dinner, then we'd pack it up, and I'd go back home, put the kids to bed, and he'd come home like at 1 a.m. Oh, wow. So at a certain point, he said, you know, this is not working for us. This is terrible for our family life. I'm super stressed out. And that's when I applied for a job at the University of Auckland, and uh, then we went to New Zealand, and we were there for about five years. And then um, uh, we had cancer part one, cancer part two, and with cancer part two, uh, we decided we should come back to the States for, for treatments. And that's when I started working at the church history department. And um, it's super awesome. So my job at the church history department um, is to work on the global histories. So histories of the church outside the US. Yeah. And um, there's so many amazing stories that should become just as kind of canonical as Mary Fielding Smith heals the ox or yes. um, the Martin Willie Handcart Company goes through the mountains and is pushed by angels. There's just so many amazing stories. Um, like Sri Laksana, the translator of the Book of Mormon, sees the writing on the wall of how to translate priesthood into Thai, or, you know, right. all these really interesting um, well, encounters that Latter-day Saints have. Yeah, and like, like we were talking about in the beginning of um, just having a worldview and understanding it and understanding, you know, how I learn is just as important as what I learn. Um, and I love that you're talking about having your definition of diversity widen the more that you had diverse experiences mm -hmm, for sure let's let's talk about because you're talking about these global stories in the church and and I love from my own mission the the stories in France the stories from my husband's ancestors who were some of the first members in Belgium but let's mm. talk about your story and growing up in in California maybe even before you went to Boston what started your religious faithful story? Is there a moment when you realized I have a story of what I would call faith? Hmm, that's a good question. So I guess you could say the story of, for me, I think for the longest time it was a story of wondering if what I had was faith. Hmm. Like I'm doing this thing um, does that count as faith? I remember trying to figure out whether I should go on a mission as an undergraduate, and I had a friend who was on a mission um, who, who had like this tremendous kind of personal impact on me because, because he kind of went before me and, um, and, and kind of reported to me on like his mission experiences and what, what was going on. And I was always kind of thinking, could I do that? Um, do I believe enough to do that, uh, to say that? Um, and, and if I went, would it be, would I be doing something that was real and valuable or would I just be this like, you know, <laughs> automaton, like, yeah, 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 person <laughs> with the name tag, um, like the, you know, the, the kind of stereotypical thing that people make fun of when they make musicals or something like that, you know? Yeah. And right. so, um, <laughs> yeah, so I just wondered for the longest time, um, if what I had was, was if my faith was valid. I, th I knew I had faith, but I didn't know if it was, um, like if it could hold up in the world. If, if that, you know yeah, you I sound mean. like a historian. <laughs> Just, yeah, I, I, I see the evidence, but is it valid? And what a, what a great question to ask. So how did you decide that it was valid enough to go on a mission? That's a good question. 
I don't think I did. Well, <laughs> I, I, love think that. I, I think I decided to go because, see, this is the question. The question is, it's working for me, but the question is, like, is it universal? Yeah. And that, that's a big question because, you know, I had been studying Buddhism and Taoism and Confucianism and, you know, these great philosophical and moral traditions, which kind of dwarf the restoration in terms of how long they've been affecting people's lives, yeah. the amount of texts that have been produced, all those kinds of things. And so, so I thought, you know, I'm a member of this little tiny um, religious denomination, and, um, and it's, it's so beautiful for me and my family. But, um, like, is it valid for me to go and, and try to, to um, introduce that universally to everyone else? So did you, f how, how did you sort of live into the, the, the answer of that, to, to go on a mission, to want to s focus on church history even now? What is it about the restoration for you that sort of holds up in comparison to all these ancient religions that you've been studying? Aha, so, so this, is, this <laughs> leads into my story. Um, as a missionary, that was exactly what I was trying to capture as an early missionary, like yeah. a, a young um, missionary. I, you know, I already spoke Mandarin because I learned it in, in, at the university. Not, not well, you know, but, but I, I, could, you know, I could already speak. I left the MTC early, which apparently made my husband really bitter because we were in the MTC at the same time and I got to go before he did. And he like wrote, you know, Sister Inouye got to go and her Chinese isn't, isn't even as good as mine. So um, I'm glad that you've reconciled that. That's right, that's yeah. right. All of, our, all of our marital fights are about Chinese. Chinese. Yeah, actually. So, I'm glad um, I don't speak Chinese then. <laughs> yeah. But, um, so when I got there, I think I had a pretty uh, prideful worldview where I said, you know, I, I know your tradition. And, and I did. I know a lot about the tradition of people in Taiwan because, you know, Taoism, Buddhism, Confucianism. And I had read, you know, some of the great Taoist and Buddhist classics. Um, and I would try to kind of get into these uh, discussions with the investigators about, like, well, you know, you've got these traditions here, and there's like this people, this is how people talk about the Tao, and like in our tradition, the Latter-day Saint tradition, you know, these are the ways. But that, that did not work at all, because people were really happy to talk about that, but nobody felt the spirit in those kinds of conversations. Mm, because it was all about what? This is what you believe, this is what well, I believe. Well, it's kind of like what but... you were saying, about the, the what you learn versus yeah, the how you learn. Yeah. So that it was like all about the what, Yeah. about the traditions. Um, but, but then, I, it, it, you know, number one, it wasn't very successful in getting people to feel the spirit and change their lives. And number two, I wasn't learning the lessons that I needed to learn as a missionary because I was like, I speak Chinese, I like know the culture, I am like the best missionary. Um, and I think I talk about this, I can't remember, I think I, I talk about this in my book, but I had this experience where I got this new companion, I was like her second, I was her second companion, so she'd just been trained. Um, and I picked her up at the train station. And the way you pick someone up at the end these days um, is you, you would go with your bike and you would bring a big flat bike tube, like, an, like a busted tube. Um, and that would be like a bungee cord. And you would like wrap it around your back rack and put it over the big suitcases right. and, go, and strap it. <laughs> and then you'd like ride home with these big suitcases on the back of your bike. So I went, I went to pick her up and we like wove through traffic on the way home. And I was having this great time. I was pointing out all the great places like, that's the Bing shop where you get the best shaved ice in China. And that's the place where they have really good dumplings. And she was just like, not, not impressed. And as a matter of fact, she seemed like really kind of like, like she was kind of coming in. And, and, and I found out, um, she told me she wasn't having a good time. Um, she didn't like Chinese food. She didn't like the language. She didn't like the culture. And I was just like, you know, Sister, like, we like, are missionaries. We work hard. We love it. That's it. You know, like, very, like, kind of, I don't know, like, my family farm tradition, just, like, stick to it. Yeah. Um, but then, like, within, like, the first day, I think we went out to do some work, and I, like, marched up to the door, and we always said a prayer before we go out the door. So I, like, marched up to the door, and I, like, you know, said, Sister, say the prayer. And I was, like, waiting. <laughs> and there's, like, no prayer. I was, like, I looked up, and her eyes were streaming with tears. I was like, oh, oh. And I, and I realized that, you know, she, I was, like, trying to represent Jesus, and I thought I was such a great missionary because we worked so hard, and, like, our stats were so high, and blah, blah, blah. But, like, 
how could I be a good missionary if the person who was closest to me, my companion, like I, I made her cry. Like that was terrible. I was being a horrible missionary. And so um, from that, that moment was a turning point, I think, in my mission and also my life. And I realized that all of my what's were rubbish. And the most important part was, was the how. And was I really you know, embodying the love of Christ? And it totally changed how I thought about missionary work. And it also changed how I thought about myself. And I realized that, that you know, at that moment, I was a terrible missionary. <laughs> and I, yeah, and I, and I worked really hard to, to kind of know Jesus a little better and to be able to represent um, Christ's love. Yeah, and I, it, it's so easy to get wrapped up in this list of things that I can do to be an effective missionary and an effective missionary of the church, that it's amazing that Christ could sort of get taken out of the equation, even though he's on your name tag. Right. Um, uh -huh. and, and, your, and your companion with, with those tears, what a sweet experience. How do you try and embody the love of Christ now? I mean, because like you've talked about, you you you've gone through cancer you've gone through other difficulties with your health with your job trying to make it work um how do you keep living that restoration it it seems like at, you you had your own restoration on your mission like oh the restored gospel is about Jesus Christ um not about the numbers so what do you do to to try and keep that focus in your life well, it's really, it's really hard, and, and this is why. I think when you're a missionary and you're working with adults, it's like an equal relationship. Um, when you are a parent and you're working with children, it's not quite the same. Like, there are times when, when your children want to do something and you, you say, no, this is, that is not what you do. And I know, I definitely know, it's, that's not the right way to do it. And that's tricky for me because um, I was making a joke before we started about like how we're all authoritarians, like some of us are just like <laughs> better at being temporary or whatever. Right, temporary authoritarians, right. Yeah. So as we're recording the podcast, we've got several children upstairs and it's, it, it, that's interesting to think of it that way. Keep going, I'm just giving a little context. Right, well, so, so I struggle with this all the time because, um, because because I was raised by, you know, former farmers and uh, on my mom's side and my dad's side. And so there's this very strong kind of like work, get with the program, stop complaining, yeah. um, just like do the hard thing. We always do the hard thing um, kind of approach. And then like there's also got to be the gospel and there's also got to be love. But then, but, but I, I wrestle all the time with this question of, you know, tough love, permissive love, you know, video game love. I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's super hard. And, and I think it's, the difference is when your own children are not quite the same as, as other adults that you interact with. Maybe they are. I don't know. <laughs> it's hard. What do you think? Young, younger versions of adults. Well, and hopefully there would be some consistency in the way that you teach them. I mean, we were talking about your Uncle Dylan. He didn't treat me like a kid. And, and that was something journal-worthy for me. Mm. So, so I'm not sure. It, just, it seems like there's consistency in God's love for us, too, even though we are his children. Mm. Um, I'm thinking about... Right now we have so many people who have, in the church who have questions about church history... Mm -hmm. And and you, one thing I love about you, and I love reading in Crossings, you you writing about this complex yet simple faith that you have. Um, when people have questions about church history, and and they they're not feeling God's love because of the questions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if if you'd be willing to talk about how you manage as a historian and, and clearly as a missionary, you saw, I'm going to stick with this. So maybe a lot of it was endurance and toughness, like you said, from your background, your parents' background. How do you keep going and not just sort of throw everything off the table? Like if, if someone's listening to this podcast and they're wondering, 
well, why does Melissa Inouye stay in the church when she, she knows church history? Why, why not just let it all go? Mm -hmm. Do you have any, what, what, when people ask that, do you have any advice or any personal experiences that would help someone who feels like it has to be all or nothing? I think there's a um, couple ways to answer that question. One is, um, I, I kind of, I think I, I, I summarized it in, in a talk that I gave um, for the Maxwell Institute, yeah. which is um, the worst thing in my mind uh, is not like human stuff that people do in church history. Uh, so in this talk, I said there's three things that aren't the, word thing, aren't the worst thing. Patriarchy is not the worst thing. <laughs> um, baldness is not the worst thing. And death is not the worst thing. Um, so what I meant by that is, um, by patriarchy, I mean this, the aspects, the structures of the world that are kind of inherently unfair or not right, or um, like they would say in, um, in, in Faith is Not Blind, there are so many things, not, not just patriarchy, racism, sexism, nationalism, all these things, um, where there's a gap between the ideal and like what we're actually able to kind of come up with yeah. uh, in, in organized groups of people. So. This is all over the world. So, so let's just take patriarchy. So I was a, a professor at the University of Auckland and like New Zealand is one of the most egalitarian, um, most woman friendly places is run by, you know, Jacinda Ardern, who's this awesome woman, actually a former Latter-day Saint, grew up seeing, I'm trying to be like Jesus, but also can just like lock down the whole country and keep out COVID for years, right? So speaking of a good kind of authority, she's, she's, well, pretty successful. Well, right. So, so New Zealand, from that point of view, is like a super, you know, yeah. non-patriarchal place. But actually, at the University of Auckland, you know, I was part of this women's group, and you know, you look at all the professors at all the different levels, and the same kind of thing happens where the higher levels are all men, the lower levels are all women, um, and and there's movements to change that. I think we just barely had our very first female vice chancellor. So, so my point is like even in New Zealand, you, you can't escape patriarchy. There's like no place you could go where you could escape that, actually. Um, right. So, and, and, you, so you couldn't exist on the earth if you insist on having a perfect society. It's just on being patriarchy free. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that's just an example. And then you know, with baldness, by baldness I mean <laughs> the things that kind of happen to us in life that we can't control. Um, my hair fell out um, about like 13 years ago. It's not related to my cancer, actually. Um, but but it, it just fell out like I could not control that it just did and you know things happen to us health happens to us um unfair things happen these just difficult things happen the world is, is is hard and we have to kind of deal with these indignities and and the pains and the sufferings of life and then finally death um you know as anyone who's had like a chronic illness or a life-threatening illness knows like death is is super scary um but it's also not the worst thing um <laughs> There, there are other things that are worse than that. And, and so that's just kind of a way of saying, I think, I think um, this idea that um, I, you know, I, I found out these things about church history that destroyed my view of, let's say, Joseph Smith or Brigham Young or yeah. early church leaders, whatever. Um, therefore, um, therefore, like the whole project is, is bogus. Um, I don't think that's, I, I understand like that sure. feeling of disillusionment. It feels like you're being kicked in the stomach or, yeah. um, but, but what that is, is a kind of like adjustment to reality, right? And, and to the kind of reality of organizations and human nature and long projects that take place over a long period of time. Yeah. So you're saying it's not just the church that would have these issues, right? Yeah, so so, like the like the great religions of the world, the great civilizations, great civilizations, they they all have these same issues. So so then, um, what I think is the worst thing is to have had no um, change in your life that makes you more useful in the lives of others, mm -hmm. to ha and to have no opportunity to be useful in those people's lives. Yeah, G.K. Chesterton would call that being an improver. <laughs> oh, right. That's, yes, that's, that's, the quote from, that's the quote from the book, of course. But um, I love that idea of being willing to change. Elder Maxwell would call it meekness, maybe. Um, 
I loved what you said once it, it's in, in crossings about about Christmas lights. Oh, right. That, that was really helpful to me too. And I think just thinking about stepping back and saying, am I being useful? And is, is the, and maybe even turning it around, is the redemption useful, the redemption and the restoration useful to me? Hmm. So that I'm being useful rather than just saying, nothing is working for me, mm -hmm. I'm leaving. Um, would you talk about the Christmas sure. lights? I, I think it's yeah. so helpful. And actually, my, my, this, met, this is a metaphor that has been kind of sorely afflicted by improvements in Christmas light technology. <laughs> but um, when I was young, um, like I remember we like set up the tree, the Christmas tree, and we strung the lights around the tree, and then like the, we're ready for the big moment, ta-da! We plug them in, and nothing happened. Yeah. Because these are the old cheap Christmas lights, where if one like junction was out, then the whole junk junction, one you know, if one like fuse or something yeah, light was out, yeah. then the whole thing didn't work. And I think sometimes we have that that idea with church history. Yeah. Like in order for for the gospel to be true, there's like this kind of light that kind of jumps from one point to another along this like whole chain of church history, and not just like from individual to individual, but like you know things that people said, things they did, every act, every kind of moment. And if there's like one bulb that's bad or faulty or flawed in some way, then the whole thing doesn't work. And actually we have a, sometimes we have like a reverse view of that too. Like we <laughs> think that um, if the church is true now, that has to mean that like everything in the past was awesome. Yeah, everything right? was valid. Everything everyone said is true now. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and either the both the kind of faith promoting and the faith destroying versions of that Christmas light analogy are really problematic because the way that people are, we're not machines where you could just like be you know kaput or on on or you know that's we're not that binary we're we're people and we we do things we change we interact with each other so I think the idea of sourdough bread um, is a better descriptor and in my family um, we have inherited. Just just recently, um, you know, my, my cousin Sarah and my cousin Mika um, gave us a sourdough starter, which you know is said to have come across the plains. They got it from someone probably wow. um, <laughs> around here, but they said it's like a really awesome culture. And they said like it's impossible to kill. You know, like you can put it in your fridge; it turns black and grows. It smells like garbage, but all you have to do is clear out most of it and put it back, and it will kind of grow again, according to what they say. I think we've killed it like a couple of times. But maybe we just didn't try hard enough to get it back. But, <laughs> but the point is that um, what a sourdough starter is, it's like a colony of little organisms, right? Yeah. It's like bacteria. And the way, they, the way they improve a bread is you dump them in, the bacteria in with the flour and the uh, salt and the water. And then the bacteria like starts to eat the flour. And it creates these byproducts. It makes make sugar. Um, it creates gas. And, and then you get this beautiful artisan bread. Yeah. And so um, you know, that's a living a living community that, um, that sustains itself and renews itself over time. And, and I think that's a better way of looking at the church as a kind of sourdough starter. I like that. Um, sometimes, sometimes there's like stinky byproducts. Sometimes, <laughs> um, sometimes uh, this is a kind of fight actually within the sourdough starters, like different strains of bacteria are competing with each other uh, in, in a different environment. Um, and that can turn, affect how the bread turns out. Um, but, but the point is that it's alive and, and it takes this kind of tasteless dust flour, if you've ever had like raw flour <laughs> and, and it turns it into beautiful artisan bread that's got complexity, it's got flavor, it's got big holes, it's got like beautiful shiny dough and, um, and, and anyone, you know, artisan bakers can appreciate that kind of complexity. And that's what I think we get when we get the church is we get something that's beautiful, complex, flavorful, and, and also real, and the the kind of product of many things happening over time. Yeah, the the bread of life. And, and, right. And, yeah, and Jesus it. talked about being the leaven, yeah, uh -huh, and being the bread of life. Yeah. Well, and letting it nourishing nourish us, like you were saying earlier. How how am I interacting with the gospel in a way that that is living and contributing and changing, um, which it was just such a better way of looking at it than something that um, is, is, is something that, that is a dead religion. It's 
still living, still changing, still restoring. Right, and, and the whole project is edgy, right? Because when, when, you know, the process of a sourdough starter working in a loaf is called fermentation. <laughs> and um, fermentation um, is a kind of fancy way for saying things are going bad, like bacteria are working on them and breaking them down. And like if you, if you just like let the sourdough start run, run wild, then it gets a very stinky, garbagey smell. So it's like yeah. fraught, but also awesome. And, and also living, which is why you know, people love to bake with sourdough so much because it's, I don't know, it's, it's more exciting. It's, <laughs> it's, alive. it's an experiment. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me just ask you one last question. Um, if there's someone listening to this podcast who is trying to decide, you know, what, what do I do? How do I make this sourdough starter start in me, living, breathing? What, what is the one piece of advice that's sort of working for you now that you would give them? Well, I would say, um, and I think we could, we could go on and on forever about yeah, this. Is, yeah. um, if you're having a hard experience at church, um, to pay attention where you're having a hard experience mm -hmm. at church and to know that there's so many other church experiences that people have like on a global scale. Mm, yeah. Does that make sense? I so, like that. so I think, I think, um, the current kind of narrative that we have, like, like the faith crisis narrative, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to oversimplify it. Sure. Um, I just, I've heard a lot of people say something like this, which is that, you know, I grew up in this, uh, church and I thought that, you know, we, I, I was taught these things, and then I grew older, and I learned history, and I um, took a close look at kind of structural issues, and I had some bad experiences, and um, and that's made me feel like what we say, like our claims are not valid. Mm -hmm. um, our claims to be like the the one true church are not valid. How could it be valid if there's you know bishops who abuse teenagers, um, if there's um, um, unkindness towards LGBTQ people that I've experienced. If I've had this experience or if I've read this part of history where this church leader said what's clearly, you know, not what Jesus would want us to say or do. Yeah. And, um, and I guess what I would, what I would say to that, I, I'm like really sympathetic to that narrative because I, like that's, that's kind of the, the paradigm that I was raised in as a kind of Western trained academic as well. Yeah. You look for consistency, you look, um, you have evidence and you look for these kinds of, uh, like, you know, are these claims valid? This, you're kind of like always weighing this question of, of the claims and the evidence. But, um, and I have like, my life has been like an endless string of faith crises basically. <laughs> um, but the reason why I think that I value the project of the restoration so much is I think that that paradigm, you know, which, which I share in, is a very narrow worldview. If you look at all the worldviews of all of God's children, like, like, like the people who, who have these kinds of views tend to be like me, uh, North Americans, educated, um, have pretty good jobs, uh, read lots of books, have, have the time to read lots of books, yeah. and to kind of have this kind of, again, I'm speaking about myself, a kind of optimization mentality. Like, um, like for example, uh, if I go to the store and I bought something that was like, turns out to be broken, I'm like, oh, they've ripped me off. I must get my money right, back. Right. Uh, uh, or like well, I'll look read reviews before I purchase something. Yeah, we're very I get the good best consumers. Thing. Yeah, right. Um, and, and and I'm not trying to like make fun of people who are trying to have a good life or <laughs> like trying to you know get value for money or whatever. But but that that perspective is a very um, my, my that perspective that's kind of my native perspective is very rarefied. If you look at like all the problems, all the challenges. Yeah all the concerns of people like in the world it's like there are so many other things that for people would say that's not the worst thing yeah 
their people's worst things are so, so different from um, the horrible feeling that you that you get when you're going through a faith, cri faith crisis. It is a truly horrible feeling. I know how that feels. But like what I'm saying, I guess, is that um, when you look at the global church and, and you look at all these people who've had these amazing experiences, who've like they have a, they have a, a dream where they see the Salt Lake Temple. Why does God care about someone in Cote d'Ivoire, you know, <laughs> seeing the Salt Lake Temple? But it happens all the time. Not all, the, but like you know, I, so many times in the stories that yeah. I that I find, um, or or you have people who are are struggling with with something, and the church is is an answer to them. It's like a lifeline. Yeah. So it just it just seems like it just seems like if you if you're struggling with the church, um, I think we should we should understand that like our particular struggles have to do with our particular expectations and context, which are usually super dependent on our like demographic. Yeah. Well, I, and I, I, I appreciate that because what it does is say, maybe step outside your worldview to, ra rather than centering on this is how I'm going to make this worldview work saying, how can I change the worldview? How can I make the worldview bigger um, so that I can see other people's experiences, not just my own? Um, and, and I can ask myself questions about how I see, how I see the world, um, because maybe there's a lot more than we can see. Always, there's a lot more than we can possibly see around us. Um, and, and I appreciate you sharing that sort of global view of um, our usefulness as missionaries and as mothers and as church members can, can be enhanced by taking a step back and looking at more of a global, larger view. So, right. Well, because that's the thing, right? Because people who, um, you know, I, I am deeply troubled by um, aspects of our, let's say, institutional culture yeah. that seem to me to be unjust or unfair or our aspects of our history that show the existence of racism, for instance. Um, and, and for those reasons, many people feel like, well, I can't be part of an institution that has these, these things in it. Um, but, but I would argue um, people who care about justice and who care about um, like equality and care about loving love for all, mm -hmm. not just for, for some people, but for all, um, might find a lot to, to value when you think about what it means to be a member of a global church. I mean, the, the fact is the church is so tiny, uh, so minuscule on the scale of you know, human religious groups that when we're global, we're, it's actually kind of meaningful because there's so few of us. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, yeah. like Catholics, they're like, they're, you know, they're everywhere. They're like a huge <laughs> section of everyone. But, but us, there's, there's not that many. So to be a Latter-day Saint is to be truly a member of a global community that one can still kind of wrap one's mind around. And, um, and I value that so much because I, I deeply care about, about justice. I care about racism. And for me, my membership in the church is a way to be involved in the challenges and the burdens of people who are facing injustice or racism all around the world. It's my opportunity to be part of, to learn from other people and to bear those burdens directly through my covenants. Yeah. And I think it's really hard in today's kind of global world. We're just like little tiny atoms in the middle of <laughs> this whole universe. And I think it becomes overwhelming. And we think the best way to to help the world is to kind of be part of a group of people who have committed no none of these certain kinds of sins, um, but but those people usually will tend to be quite a lot like us already. Yeah. And I think um, what God expects from us is to be connected to everyone, all of God's children, and that's like a super hard thing to do. And I, and you know, as a church, we're still learning how to do that. But I think um, we're taking all these steps to try yeah. to do that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. You, you've given us so much to think about, um, and and I appreciate you carrying on the legacy of both the hardworking hardworking farmers in your family and the legacy of love. Thank you for for teaching us how to do that a little bit better, and and for sharing that with us. Thank you, Melissa, so much. Oh, no problem. Thanks for your insights. It will hopefully help me be a better parent. <laughs> yeah.
Thank you. <laughs>